And Isaiah chapter 59 is a call to national repentance, uh, which is something that I don't think, uh, at least in modern day America, um, David is our historian that's on here, and he could tell us more so. It, uh, but in modern day America, it doesn't seem like we understand, as a nation, that we understand what national repentance is. Um, perhaps we did in the um, bygone eras. I don't know. There, and there's hints of that, certainly strong hints of that in uh, Lincoln's second inaugural address. Uh, but nowadays, it seems to be all about individuals and all about, uh, you know, the American myth of the 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 Lone Ranger who who uh, uh, was the settler and the and the pioneer and the um, cowboy and all of that stuff. Um, so uh, I, I think it's something that as a nation, we need to learn or relearn or whatever it is that we need to do. Um, we, um, uh, and it's something that, uh, Israel was dealing with here in chapter 59, the setting, it's a really a continuation of the theme that we saw in chapter 58. Um, it's probably taking place, uh, and this is a guess about a decade before, I mean, about a decade after the repatriation of the land began, uh, Israel was the, the nation of Judah um, and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed in 587 BC. Jews were carried captive into Babylon in 538 BC. A decree was issued that allowed them to start coming back into the land. And so this is probably about a decade or so after that. And the people are frustrated. Um, they're disappointed. Um, the rebuilding of the city, the rebuilding of the temple is going much more slowly than they thought it should or that they hoped it would. Uh, and there's much more opposition than they anticipated. And so they're disappointed. And uh, some of them are blaming God. And so the first half of Isaiah 59 is basically telling us the problem is not God. <laughs> the problem is you guys. Um, and the second half of chapter 59 uh, shows us that God is, in fact, the solution. So the first half is kind of negative. God's not the problem. Uh, the second half is positive. Uh, God is the answer. Uh, see, the Lord's arm is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have made barriers between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So as a nation, uh, it seemed to them that God was kind of absent in the background, hidden, um, not actively involved in helping them. And, you know, it can seem like that to us as individuals as well. And when that happens, uh, it, it could be one of several things. Uh, the things that come to my mind are, first of all, what chapter 59 is about, and that is sin. Uh, if there's unconfessed sin in our lives, uh, or if there's unconfessed sin in the nation, and we'll get to that a little bit more later, um, that that can, uh, it, it doesn't make God go away, but it, it does uh, sort of hide God from us in the sense that we can't hear God's voice. We don't feel God's presence. We don't see God's blessings in our lives. Um, it, so during those times when, when uh, uh, and, and we all go through them, those times when it, you're not feeling the presence of God like, like you used to or, you know, like you want to, um, the, the first thing that I do is, is uh, in prayer, you know, ask God to search me and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God's in the business of uh, always of revealing sin so that we can confess it and be rid of it. God doesn't hide sin from you. So we don't ever need to, to you know, kind of get into a panic and there must be some sin in my life, but I don't know what it is and that kind of thing. Um, God will show you. But also there are those times when God seems hidden just because of circumstances. 
as an individual, if you're experiencing uh, a great deal of pain, physical pain or or emotional pain, you know, the loss of a loved one, for example, um, during those times, um, the the pain is so intense, the circumstances are so negative um, that you can't really feel the presence of God uh, like you would like to often. Um, but of course, God's still there, just like the sun is still shining, even on a cloudy, rainy day. Uh, but circumstances can kind of get in the way. And then uh, for us as individuals, um, there are those periods that um, some of the um, great saints of the past have called dark nights of the soul. And, and I think they happen to any person who, and to every person probably, who is really serious about following Jesus. Uh, there are times when it's not the result of circumstances. It's not the result of any sin. It's just a time when uh, it, it doesn't feel like God is there. God is there, but it doesn't feel like it. And, you know, what, what do you do during those times? Uh, well, you keep on doing what God has called you to do. Uh, Mother Teresa went through decades of what I would call a dark night of the soul. Um, she doubted the existence of God. Uh, she had a very, very profound mystical experience with the living God that started her ministry. Um, and But later on in the ministry, um, the feelings weren't there. The presence of God seemed like it had deserted her. Uh, but what she did was she, she just kept on being faithful to the original vision. She kept doing what God had called her to do um, day after day. And it must have been hard, um, you know, without that uh, source of encouragement. But she she stuck with it and um, uh, is, I'm sure, now enjoying the presence of God. Uh, for your hands are defiled with blood, God says, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one brings suit justly, talking about lawsuits. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies, conceiving mischief and bearing iniquity. So uh, what God's concerned with here in chapter 59 are are national sins. The nation of it isn't just that some individuals were off track, although I'm sure they were, but it's that as a nation, they had to come to understand that as a group, they were off track. Those are national sins. Your hands are covered with blood. Um, there were people that were engaged in child sacrifice. There were people that were engaged in war. There were people that were uh, in, you know, murder was in the land. Um, uh, I, I threw capital punishment in there uh, as well, because, um, you know, in the United States today, um, it's estimated that at least 4% of those on death row are probably innocent. You say, well, that's just 4%. Well, yeah, you know, that's a lot of innocent people. Um, and uh, when when you execute someone, um, you have removed the possibility that they can repent, that they can change. As long as a person's alive, uh, they're redeemable. Um, and that's why I'm personally opposed to capital punishment. Um, God goes on and he lists, you know, their national sins, lies, half-truths, manipulation, frivolous lawsuits, coercion, unethical compromises, injustice, violence, greed, oppression, and so forth. National sins. Uh, what we could argue over or we could discuss what our national sins are today, um, and it kind of depends on which side of the political spectrum you're on, what you notice the most. Um, but the United States has some foundational sins, um, and there's no getting around it. Um, the and and you know it's not that the people that founded this country were especially evil or anything. Um, they thought they were doing the right thing. They really thought that God had sent them. Many of them really thought that God had sent them to this place. Um, back in the Middle Ages, in the 15th century, 
uh, people really believed that that the Pope spoke for God. And when the Pope said it's your Christian responsibility to uh, uh, to go to these lands across the globe and uh, subdue them, uh, if the indigenous people there will become Christians, then you can make them slaves. If they won't become Christians, slaughter them and take their land and, and um, you know, claim it for uh, for king and queen and pope and so forth. Um, they really believed that they were doing God's will. But regardless, you can really believe something and be way off track. And the United States was founded on stolen land. Um, massive genocide of the indigenous people. And then that land was worked, of course, with African slaves and with their descendants and you can build an economy very quickly when you steal the land and then don't have to pay anybody that works on the land. Um, God goes on with this interesting metaphor. He says, they hatch adders' eggs and weave the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs dies and the crushed egg hashes out a viper. Their webs cannot serve as clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity and deeds of violence are in their hands. Um, some people uh, really struggle with these verses because they say, well, uh, an, an adder, which is another name for a pit viper, uh, doesn't lay eggs. Actually, there is one that does lay eggs. It's the Asian pit viper. Uh, whether any of the Jews in the Middle East would have come across one or not, I don't know, or even if they would know what it was. It is possible because there was trade going on between uh, uh, Persia and the the Far East, where those vipers live. Um, but that's not the point. The, the point of what the author's saying here, uh, it, he's using metaphors. And, and the metaphor, and basically there's two of them. He's saying your behavior is like trying to clothe yourself with spider's webs. It's like instead of putting on clothing, you're wrapping yourself up in spider webs, and you're thinking that that that's sufficient to protect you from the elements. And the end result of your behavior, which we've already seen is behavior that's unjust, that's um, manipulative, that's violent, um, and so forth. The end result of that behavior is, is like eating something that's deadly poisonous. Um, and, and so, you know, the reference there to uh, vipers' eggs. Their feet run to evil. They rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their ways. Their roads have they have made crooked. No one who walks in them knows peace. God here is describing the national sin of the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, uh, about a decade or so after they began to flow back into the land, to repatriate the land after the Babylonian exile. I think it's something, though, that um, uh, certainly applies in, in our situation as well. The way of peace they don't know. There's no justice in their ways. Uh, their roads they have made crooked. No one who walks in them walks in the way of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, um, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus came in, in order that we might be reconciled to God and to each other and to ourselves and to creation. Um, so um, as a follower of Jesus, we should always be on the side of peace. I think we need to um, sometimes lay our politics aside um, I, I know what I'm thinking of is I, I know Christians that are uh, uh, very, very strongly pro-Israel. Well, you know, I, I recognize that the Holocaust, you know, was um, one of the most horrible things that's ever happened in the history of humanity. And I recognize that countries around the world closed their doors to the Jews and that uh, the Jews uh, needed a, a haven, a place to be. And I know the history about the Balfour Declaration and the way that France and 
uh, Great Britain, and uh, later on the United States sort of carved up the Middle East and created these countries that we have now. And I, I understand the Jewish need for uh, feeling the need for a defensible place to live. Uh, and, and so I, and, and I love Jews, you know, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, as a follower of Jesus, I always have to come down on the side of peace. So I, I, I cannot support um, at, like in this example, I cannot support um, the the far right government of Israel using violence against um, Palestinians, many of whom happen to be Christian and whose families have lived in that particular area for 600 years. And I didn't mean to get off on, you know, that political rant. But uh, my point is <laughs> that uh, as we look at world affairs, uh, I want to always land on the side of peace, always uh, on the side of reconciliation. Uh, as a result of their violence and their rebellion and their uh, injustice, uh, justice, they said, therefore, justice is far from us. Deliverance does not reach us. We wait for light, but there's only darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. These are, that's the response to what God is saying. Because of national sin, they're saying there's no justice. We're not experiencing any deliverance. We're not experiencing any spiritual light. You see, they're, they're, they're getting the message. They're understanding that uh, the difficulties that they're going through aren't God's fault. And it's not because God is absent or God's busy or God doesn't like them anymore or any of that stuff. Uh, the the problem is as a nation uh they are an unjust they they're not they're not practicing justice they're not practicing uh, the ways of god and so as a result uh we grope like blind along a wall groping like those who have no eyes we stumble at noon as in the twilight among the vigorous as though we were dead we all growl like bears, like doves, we moan mournfully. We wait for justice, but there is none, for salvation, but it is far from us. So we have a whole series of similes there. Uh, we're stumbling around as if we were blind. Uh, we're, uh, we don't have any energy. There are people around us that are all full of uh, vigor, but we don't have the, any, any of that positive energy. We're, we're growling like bears, um, uh, a, a way of uh, referring to complaining all the time, mourning like mourning doves. For our transgressions before you, before you, God, are many and our sins testify against us. Notice this confession. Uh, the, the prophet here is speaking on behalf of Israel. Now, um, Isaiah the prophet uh, was a just person. He personally, um, you know, there's no evidence that he personally was violent or that he was um, unjust to anybody or filing frivolous lawsuits or any of the rest of it. But he sees himself not just as an individual, but as a part of the whole. And he takes that to heart. And so he prays, for our transgressions before you are many. He's, he's not praying, well, all these other people, they're transgressing. And all these other people around me, they're all sinning, and it testifies against them. Um, it, no, he, he's, he's owning it because he's a part of the culture. And, and that's where I think the, at least present-day United States, uh, doesn't understand the... Um, uh, what's the word I'm fishing for? The 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 uh, uh, collective consciousness of the culture. Um, we we see ourselves as such individuals. I don't know how many people I've run into um, in in recent years, and they're and they're always white people who who say, "Well, 
anytime reparations comes up, they say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, I don't own any slaves and those people have never been slaves. So why should people that don't own slaves um, pay people that never were slaves? Yeah, I heard Mitch McConnell say that not too long ago. Uh, I'm not quoting him exactly, but that's essentially what he said. Um, because we don't understand that we share a common uh, standing before God. Um, so, so I love the fact, and, and you know, we, we see this in, in uh, all godly people. Um, you know, Daniel, there's, there's nothing um, negative mentioned about Daniel at all. In, in all the scripture. Yet when he prays, he says, we have sinned, we have transgressed. And here Isaiah is doing the same thing, for our transgressions before you are many, and our sins testify against us. Uh, our transgressions indeed are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from following our God, talking oppression and revolt, conceiving lying words and uttering them from the heart, um, understanding that we are part of a group. That's national confession. Um, and just like individual confession, national confession needs to be specific and it needs to be sincere. And uh, as I've already said a couple of times, um, I, I don't think that the United States is very good at that. <laughs> at least present day United States. Now, some other nations seem to have done it better. Um, there's been a real effort in Germany to repent of um, the whole Holocaust and Hitler and the Third Reich um, and, to, and to make sure that everybody in their education understands what happened and, and why it happened and prevent it from happening again. It's been a real uh, effort, uh, I think, on the part of Germans since World War II, at Germany as a whole, not every individual, but Germany as a whole since World War II. But um, the United States uh, has never reckoned with uh, the way this nation started, has never reckoned uh, with uh, slavery, never reckoned with um, indigenous um, um, persecution, stealing of land, and so forth. Um, repentance, of course, just as it is with an individual, means we change our minds and we change our direction. Um, it means recognizing where we're off track and turning back on track. Scripture goes on. This is part of the confession. Justice is turned back. Deliverance stands at a difference, at a distance. For truth stumbles in the public square and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and whoever turns from evil is despoiled. That sounds like such a description of where we are today, uh, because our public square is the internet. And much of, as you know, much of social media uh, provides platforms for lies and conspiracies and um, all sorts of, uh, of uh, vitriol and hatred and anti-Semitism and racism and so forth. And um, the, the way that social media is set up, it encourages us to live in silos um, where we're, we're only listening to people that are like us and we're, we're surrounding ourselves with people that, you know, you can't get a new idea in there. Um, but as followers of Jesus, we're not Democrats, we're not Republicans, we're, we're, we're not following the donkey, we're not following the elephant, we're following the Lamb of God. Uh, we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and uh, that, that, makes, that causes us to not be in any of those, of those silos. And therefore, we get sniped at, you know, we, we get condemned um, from different directions um, because we're seeking to follow God. So God is not the problem. In fact, God, just the opposite of the problem, is the solution. The Lord saw it, 
saw all the sin, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So what did he do? He gave up on everybody and wiped them out. No. His own arm brought him victory, and his righteousness upheld him. So, first of all, God says he was appalled that no one was speaking out against the injustice, which reminds me of those famous words of uh, Dr. King when he spoke about the appalling silence and indifference of the good people. Um, the people that say, well, you know, just let time go by and everything will get better and better and better. Um, we need to speak out against injustice. Um, we need to recognize that um, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. So God says, I, in essence, I'm paraphrasing, uh, the scripture here is saying that God looked at Israel, saw the injustice, and decided to intervene. And how did he intervene? He got victory through his right arm, which is a, um, throughout the Old, the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, you'll see that phrase, God's right arm. It's very often, and you can tell by the context, a description of Messiah. Jesus is God's right arm. Jesus is speaking the words of God, doing the actions of God, showing us who God is. So the victory over the sin, over the injustice, over the national problems, the national sin, comes through the self-sacrificial love of God's people. The victory comes by facing down the lies of the false gods, which in our case, the big ones are nationalism, consumerism, and militarism. Back in biblical times, they were called Caesar, Mammon, and Mars. Different names, but it's the same thing. Victory comes through the cross. The power to change lives comes through the cross. So what do we do as we're in a nation um, you know, recognizing that the nation has gone astray, the nation has not repented. We, we like Isaiah, we call the nation to repentance. We point out the injustices. We stand up on behalf of justice. Uh, but ultimately, the victory isn't going to be won through, you know, some sort of armed revolution or or yeah, I'm I'm all for voting, but the victory isn't going to be won primarily through the ballot box. It's going to be won primarily through our self-sacrificial love, through us acting like Jesus, for us standing up against nationalism, consumerism, and militarism, and living differently. Um, that way, we are exalting, we're glorifying, we are um, sh uh, uh, lifting up Jesus, so that the world around us can see this path that leads to righteousness, that leads to love, that leads to making all things new. Speaking of God, verse 17 says, God put on righteousness like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. Now, uh, the Apostle Paul picks up on that, but he also shifts it. Uh, because as we'll get to in just a moment, you see the 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 following uh, verses uh, talk about God's vengeance and wrath and all that stuff. Um, that's not where Paul goes. He starts out with the helmet of salvation when he talks about tells us to put on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter six. Um, put on the helmet of salvation. Salvation means freedom. It means deliverance. From whatever it is that's that's holding us back, whatever it is that has us in bondage, that's the helmet of salvation. Uh, he tells us he picks up this this phrase about the breastplate of righteousness, doing the right thing. But then the apostle Paul goes on, not talking about vengeance and and um, uh, you know killing bad guys and all that, and he speaks of a belt of truth speaking the truth, living the truth. He speaks of having wearing shoes of peace, 
spreading shalom and reconciliation. He speaks of the shield of faith, which is trusting in God, and of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, how do we influence our culture to turn away from the things of the world, to turn away from um, consumerism, to turn away from nationalism, to turn away from uh, the sins of of racism and 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 um, you know especially the the embedded racism that causes and perpetuates so much poverty. How, how do we call our nation uh, to to turn away from uh, militarism and from the idea that violence is the answer to whatever the problems may be? What do we do? Again as individuals, but more importantly, collectively as followers of Jesus. Well, we need to, first of all, proclaim salvation. And that means a lot more than just you need to accept Jesus so you can go to heaven when you die. That's included. But salvation is much broader than that. It means that we are proclaiming the need for freedom, for deliverance, deliverance from drugs, deliverance from alcohol, deliverance from uh, poverty, deliverance from violence, deliverance from um, polluted air, you know, the list goes on. It, it means that we wear the breastplate of righteousness, which means we live our lives in such a way that we're doing the right thing. The Bible says Jesus went about doing good, and that's what we're supposed to be doing, just go about doing good. <laughs> uh, we collectively are to be, and individually, are to be speaking the truth, living the truth. We're to be spreading shalom, wholeness, uh, peace, reconciliation. Uh, God's given us the ministry of reconciliation, Paul tells us. We need to live our lives collectively so that we're trusting in God. We're, we're, yes, we get out the vote, but we're not trusting in the vote. Do you see what I'm saying? We're trusting in God to use these other means to make the changes that are needed. And we stay in touch with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is not the Bible. The Word of God is Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible points to Jesus. The Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, leading up to Jesus. Uh, the Gospels revealing Jesus. The rest of the New Testament interpreting the revelation of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So it, it's it's not a just, uh, it, we don't worship a book. We worship Jesus. He is the Word of God, and He is absolutely infallible. So as we do those things, what we're doing is helping to turn the nation away from the path of destruction and towards God. Now, you notice in the rest of chapter, I mean, in the rest of verse 17 and following, uh, Scripture says he, referring to God, put on garments of vengeance for clothing, wrapped himself in fury as a mantle. According to their deeds, he will repay wrath to his adversaries, requital to his enemies. To the coastlands, he will render requital. So those in the west shall fear the name of the Lord, and those in the east his glory, for he will come like a pent-up stream that the wind of the Lord drives on. Um, this Old Testament view of a warrior God. But all of this vengeance and all of this wrath, by the time we get to the New Testament, is replaced with salvation and faith and love and hope, truth and shalom. Why is that? Because Jesus absorbed, when he hung on the cross, he absorbed all the wrath. He absorbed all the vengeance. He absorbed all the evil all the violence, all the evil in the entire universe, uh, all the results of all the sins uh, were uh, laser beamed, as it were, uh, into Jesus, and he absorbed them all on the cross, and evil imploded, death imploded, sin imploded. He broke the power of sin on the cross. He's living. He rose from the dead, enabling us now 
to be temples of the Holy Spirit, the pouring out his spirit on us, putting his spirit within us and upon us. Jesus is in us, over us, under us, around us, front, back, sides, with us, never leaving us, never forsaking us, enabling us to live like Jesus, enabling us to love our enemies, go the second mile, turn the other cheek, freely give, sell everything and follow Jesus, freeing us from, um, you know, that, that consumeristic desire to own more and more stuff, freeing us from violence, freeing us from, uh, etc. <laughs> so that uh, the, the kingdom of God can be manifest to the world around us. And he will come to Zion as redeemer to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouths of your children or out of the mouths of your children's children, says the Lord, from now on and forever. That's God's covenant with Israel. Most of us are not Jewish, but we have, through Messiah Jesus, been grafted into the vine called Israel. And the love of God has made us part of this family of God, family that starts with the Jews, you know. Well, it starts with Abraham and with his descendants. But we're a part of that family now, and God's made a covenant with us. And the covenant is that God's spirit and words will never depart from us. You see, the new covenant is not just an agreement between God and the church or God and a group of people, because that can be broken. Um, you know, if God makes an agreement with, with us, um, you know, you do this, that, and the other thing, and then I'll bless you. Uh, well, chances are pretty good that we're not going to do this, that, and the other thing. We're going to break the covenant through our rebellion. But the new covenant is an agreement within the heart of the Trinity. It's the love that flows between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that spills over to create the world. It's an agreement that when sin enters into the picture, that the Son will voluntarily come to this earth as a human being and bear the sins of the cosmos. It's an agreement that the Father will accept that sacrifice. It's an agreement that the Holy Spirit will resurrect Jesus from the dead and indwell those who put their faith and trust in him. It's a covenant. It's an agreement within the heart of the Trinity. Therefore, it cannot be broken. God puts his words of love, grace, forgiveness, and mercy in our mouths, and he says it will never leave our mouths. Why? So that we can share his love, grace, forgiveness, and mercy with other people. So that we can share with them verbally, so that we can share with them through what we do. He gives us his, he, he's made us part of this new covenant so that we can experience the grace of God and share it with others. Oh, Lord, I just praise you and bless you and thank you for your goodness and your mercy, which is just indescribable. Thank you for uh, grafting us into the tree of Israel. Thank you, oh, Lord, for making us part, for, for accepting us in the beloved, for making us part of your family. And now, oh, Lord, as we recognize a little bit more than perhaps we used to our our collective place in the culture in which we live help us lord collectively to be a 
a positive influence for Jesus, to shine with the love of Christ, to demonstrate the forgiveness of enemies, to be people of shalom, to be people who seek and who spread reconciliation, to be people of justice, to be people who stand in solidarity with the poor and with the broken, with the addicted, with the incarcerated, with the refugees, with the homeless, with the sick, with the mentally ill, and so on. Oh, Father, may we collectively shine so brightly as kingdom people that others will recognize, know us by our love, and be drawn to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.